Hello and welcome to the latest Bristol University Press webinar on COP26 and new strategies for climate action. I'm Fiona Howie, I'm the Chief Executive of the Town and Country Planning Association and I'm delighted to be chairing this event today. Before I introduce our fantastic lineup of speakers, I must run through some housekeeping. Uh, after each of our panelists have contributed, uh, there will be a chance for Q&A and some discussion. So please do put your questions in the Q&A function, which should be at the bottom of your screen. And I will put as many of them as I can to our panelists at the, uh, after they've spoken. If you have any technical issues, please use the chat function and someone will try and help you through that. Uh, we have closed captions enabled on this webinar. Uh, there's a button, but there should be a button at the bottom of your screen um, around uh, relating to live transcripts. So please use that uh, to show or to hide uh, the text as you prefer. Uh, and then also there are detail, there will be details of how to order uh, the books written by our panel members um, at 50% discount. Uh, so, and the code to use will be CLIMATE50 at checkout, but that will also be put in the chat so you'll uh, have all of the links and all of the info about that uh, as well. So to properly introduce uh, this webinar, audience members may well be aware of Alok Sharma's speech at UNESCO in Paris earlier this month. Um, of course, part of his role as president of COP26 has been urging countries to commit to net zero by the middle of the century and to set ambitious targets to cut emissions by 2030. But as he also highlighted in his speech, the targets must translate into change across our economies and our societies, which of course welcome words, and we need to see that put into action. As of approximately one o'clock today, the UK now has a new net zero strategy. Uh, and I have to confess, I have not managed to wade through all of it yet, uh, but I can appreciate some of our audience might have done. But from a TCPA point of view, we're pleased to see that it does at least make the link between the important role of land use planning in relation uh, to uh, co common challenges, they, it stays, says, like combating climate change, but it also uh, relates planning to supporting sustainable growth, which I know at least one of our speakers will pick up on later. So this webinar is a, ch is a chance for our speakers to tell us what new strategies are needed, um, assuming that the net zero strategy hasn't cracked everything, um, and what strategies should be prioritised by the government in order to tackle climate change and enable us to innovate sustainably. So I will introduce our first speaker, Rebecca Willis is a professor in energy and climate governance at Lancaster, Lancaster Environment Centre, where she leads the Climate Citizens Project. In 2020, she was an expert lead for Climate Assembly UK, the Citizens Assembly established by the UK Parliament. So welcome, Rebecca, and over to you. Thank you. Thanks very much, Fiona. And I'm really pleased to be here. It is quite a momentous day, as you said, and I found myself uh, doing a, a live uh, Radio 4 interview uh, about half an hour after the strategy had been launched. So, um, and, and, and I don't know, I, I, I don't know whether uh, that's because, I don't yet know whether that's because government didn't want us to read too closely or whether there is a lot of treasure buried in those 368 pages. But um, I actually wanted to start not with, you know, today's announcements, but actually to take stock of um, where we are in the lead up to COP26 and to focus in particular on that shift that happened two years ago at Paris, because um, until, uh, un until the Paris Agreement, basically climate negotiations had happened top down. The way it worked, as many of you will know, is that company, uh, countries came together to thrash out what they called burden sharing, which is an interesting phrase, as in they um, agreed between each other what uh, what targets um, each country would, would contribute to the overall goal of reducing emissions. And so it was top down the, you know, through the UN process, each country was given a target and it was then given the job of going away um, and delivering that. And basically that system fell apart in Copenhagen in 2009 because to my mind, quite understandably, um, a lot of countries didn't feel that they could sell to their electorates this idea that, you know, uh, a, a sort of top down UN process would mandate 
how their economies run. And so the big shift in Paris was from that sort of top down target setting to the approach that's uh, known as pledge and review, where basically each country, instead of being taking away a target from the negotiation, each, tar each country has to pledge in advance, which is what we're seeing now with Paris, each country pledges in advance what they can offer to the overall goal of keeping warming uh, to 1.5 degrees. Um, and then those targets are all put on the table and we see whether or not they add up to the uh, to the goal. It's pretty clear going into Paris that those targets, that those individual country strategies do not add up to the goal. Um, but the point is that it has really put the spotlight on each nation state to in advance negotiate a strategy which it feels goes with the grain of what they want to do as a country and implicitly what their um, what their citizens want to see um, and, and that shift in uh, from Copenhagen to Paris is I think really fundamental and overlooked because it mirrors the shift that now needs to happen in each country and let me use the example of of the UK basically up until now in the UK and this is what I, I write about in the book that I published with Bristol University Press too hot to handle up until now um, governments have sort of done climate change top down <laughs> they've found all sorts of ways to reduce emissions most of which are things which they want people to not worry about so decarbonizing the power sector um, efficiency gains in industry and so on and basically what they've said to people is don't worry your pretty little heads about this we'll solve it for you um, if you look at the changes that are ahead in terms of changes to the way we live in our homes and heat our homes, in terms of the way we the way we way we travel around, the shift to electric vehicles, more walking and cycling and public transport and so on, if you look at the changes needed to diet and farming, you'll see that they will change the way that we live our lives and you can't hide that. I would argue that you shouldn't hide it because actually um, the polls say that people are really worried about climate change and they're willing to play their part both as you know as consumers in terms of what they buy um, and also as citizens in terms of uh you know accepting uh there is in terms of accepting the need for government to lead the way in that shift but you know i've i've spent many years basically hanging out in the climate policy community and we're not actually very good at looking at this through a democratic lens uh, we're not actually very good at looking at this as what i might call a social contract between citizen and state and so that's what i really want to delve into now and what my research at lancaster um is 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 looking at and what i covered in that in that book um, in fact, the opposite is often true, that it's now become sort of almost modish in climate policy circles to say, oh, it's too late to persuade people, we just need to get on and do it. And implicitly, they're sort of, they're sort of putting forward an eco-authoritarian approach that, you know, the experts must be in charge, we've got to just plough on and do it, whether or not people like it. Um, and the, the, the earth scientist James Lovelock is one of the few to say this explicitly and that he said it may be necessary to put democracy on hold for a while to tackle climate change. So, I mean, James Lovelock was explicit and probably goes further than most people would. But if you look at um, Bill Gates's book, for example, How to Avoid a Climate Disaster, it's all about, you know, enlightened investment strategies and, and, and well-meaning entrepreneurs and barely a mention of politics. And he, he seems to imply that there's no need to bother about winning hearts or minds or votes. It'll sort of happen through this incredible upsurge of investment and entrepreneurship. Um, and of course, there are those who look approvingly toward China, um, a country where that lack of dem democratic accountability um, allows leaders to take tough and unpopular decisions. Now, I think that's a misreading of China, but that's another, another story. But the common theme in all these accounts is that the public is not to be trusted, that they don't understand or care, that they're too short selfish, too short-sighted, and it's better to let the experts decide. And uh, I have come to pretty much the opposite conclusion. Um, scientists 
and, and, and policy experts, including myself, might have that evidence at their disposal. But under whose authority do we make these deeply social decisions about who wins and who's uh, and who loses decisions about how to regulate how those regulations would happen um and you know the best that can be said about this sort of expert-led plan is that it glosses over the really complex realities of political and social and legal change and um you know actually turning to china there's plenty of studies that show that autocratic regimes actually do uh, historically have done worse on climate action um so although i would be the first to admit that our democracy and many democracies are deeply flawed um it's really hard to disagree with churchill's pithy summary that democracy is the worst form of government except for all the others um, so my uh, my experience and my research leads me to a different conclusion. I think the data just doesn't support this idea that the public are uncaring or uninformed. Instead, we see research consistently confirming high levels of concern across different ages, demographic groups, parts of the world, but also a really deep mistrust in government and political elites. Um, and you know, which is which is uh, seen above all by the rise of populism. So we have this cynical but climate concerned population frustrated with politicians and their inability to act decisively in the face of growing impacts. And this actually leads me to think that we have not too much democracy, but too little. And what would happen if instead we began with the assumption that people can and do make sensible decisions if they have the evidence and the time and space and the influence that, that, that we need? And that's why I was really pleased to be part last year of this incredible experiment called Climate Assembly UK. It was a citizens assembly where we brought together 100 people, representative of the UK as a whole. And over four weekends, they discussed, um, debated with experts and with each other and voted on recommendations to parliament and it's a coherent far-reaching set of policies for tackling climate change created by a different sort of democratic body um, but i think making democracy work better for the climate doesn't just mean hearing more from people it also means hearing less from those economic interests like oil majors and airlines who have a stake in the high carbon status quo and you know recently we've actually seen um corporations suing governments under trade law claiming that climate policy passed by democratically elected parliaments has damaged their profits and is therefore illegal so it's about hearing more from people and actually less from certain interests so i think what's really necessary as we hit this absolute crunch time for climate both leading up to cop 26 but even more importantly as each country um walks away from uh cop 26 hopefully thinking right what can i contribute um as we reach this crucial moment we need to not dispense with democracy but double down on it and see the climate crisis not as something that can be solved by experts or actually through individual sacrifices by heroic consumers but see it as the negotiation of a new sort of social contract between uh, people and the state and i i think you know coming back to where i i started i think that's both a more realistic and a more positive account of the absolutely huge task that's ahead of us and it's actually one that sort of gives me uh that, that, that gives me hope and certainly the, the the people i work with like the members of climate assembly uk um gave us all a sense of common purpose that you know we can do this and that that, um, governments and people working together can um, can bring about that that huge and actually quite motivating transition that's needed. So I'll stop there, but I'd be very interested to hear um, people's views. Thank you very much, Rebecca. Really useful. Um, as mentioned, there will be a chance for questions, so please do put them in the Q and A function. But I will introduce Richard Joy. Without further ado, Richard's been actively involved in environmental politics for a number of years. And during 2019-2020, he worked with a task force headed by Sir Ed Davey, providing advice on options for green growth and the transition to a net zero economy. So, welcome, Richard, and over to you. Hiya. 
Good. Um, I'm just going to share some slides and I will go through them fairly quickly, I'm afraid. Let me just see. Uh, is that sharing? Cool. Good. I think um, your statement that you made at the beginning, Fiona, about um, a government statement on uh, addressing the climate challenge by translating to actions across our society was one of the most heartening things I've heard in a long time. I, I wait to see how that it actually um, develops, but I think there is a recognition there that this is really a, a large issue that's going to involve how we live our lives and the sort of society that we're in. But the basic premise for this is that technology is not enough. And I guess my fear is that COP26 may focus on the, the goal of net zero, which is absolutely imperative, but it might proclaim a success and then everybody walks away feeling that's fantastic, job done, now we just need to get into the detail and get some of these things done. So the, the issues really go beyond that. So the basic problem, well, the economy is driven by profit and growth. And profit obviously is the difference between revenues and costs. And one of the problems is that for a lot of corporations, the environmental costs of what they do do not actually show up in their bottom line. Added to that, we've got uh, growing populations, global populations, and their expectations of a consumer lifestyle. And the current trajectory is unsustainable. It's environmentally unsustainable. Uh, we're damaging the natural environment, the way in which we are, uh, um, the collapse of the rainforests, uh, agricultural land, desertification, the fertility of the land. Uh, clearly fossil fuels are causing global warming. Hopefully that issue will be addressed. Um, Economically, it's unsustainable. We've got finite resources, growing demand, even without the threat of climate change. We need to step back and actually look at how our global economic model is actually depleting the resources that we depend on. And it's socially unsustainable. So growing inequality, but also the issues that are going to be created by climate change drought, fires, floods, displacement of people, um, that's going to move populations out of regions where the West Africa, they can you know, struggle to feed themselves because of the consequence of industrialized fishing off the coast of West Africa, uh, displacing populations, social unrest, potential political conflict. So all of those things, we're heading on a path which is currently unsustainable. And, you know, a massively simplistic model, but on the right hand side, there's the sort of the social economic issues, of consumerism and environmental costs and growth and how society expects uh, to be able to buy cheap goods and politicians obviously are elected on the promise of such things, how the economy actually produces those goods, the impact that has on the natural environment and the climate, and as the climate changes, the impact that's going to have on society. So all of these things are interdependent. For COP26, there are four stated goals on the, the big glossy document that I looked at, and that is to secure net zero by mid-century, to keep within the 1.5 degree target, uh, to adapt to protect communities and natural habitats, not quite sure what's behind that, but clearly that's important if you're trying to reverse desertification and support indigenous communities, which uh, I've forgotten the exact figures, but it's something like 5% of the population are indigenous and they are on 20% of the land and they are responsible for 80% of the species in our natural habitats. So, the other two are mobilising finance, which is clearly an issue of how do we actually make this stuff happen in an economic sense and working together to deliver. They are essential goals. There is no doubt about that. They are good goals. 
but effectively they are triage policies. They are things that we need to do to give ourselves breathing space so that we can actually survive and do not pass a tipping point in whenever it might be, 10, 20, 30, 40, 50 years, whatever your level of optimism uh, suggests. So leaders need to actually address the underlying causes. We cannot continue with the status quo. So if you sort of look at the, the forces protecting the status quo, they are things such as the global economic model, the pursuit of growth, and the pursuit of profit, and the fact there's little accounting for environmental cost. There's a gentleman called uh, Sir Ronald Cohen. He is an international financier, and he's, he did some work, and his findings suggested that of the top 250 companies, their, um, the environmental cost of their activities is greater than their collective profits. You look at the consumption of society and our expectations, the political systems and how political parties seek support from the corporate sector and media support and seek popularity. The demand by the electorate and consumers and employees for high job security, high standards of living, and also the relationship of wealth and media, the financial system and our dependency on oil. So as we go into top, COP26, you know, what, what would I like to see happening? What would be the messages to the leaders? Well, I think environmental cost accountability, hugely complex issue, but we could at least make a start with things such as making sure that resources that come from unsustainable land and rainforest are addressed. The, the uh, incentivize sustainable consumer behavior. We, we do this already, carrier bags, the taxes that we pay on fuel duties and so forth. But what are the changes that we need to see? What's the transition and how do we guide that? And I think one thing that COVID-19 showed us is that when people are actually facing a direct threat, they are able to make radical changes in their lives and their expectations. And they understand why that's happening. But the other things around sustainable policies, clearly for energy, transport, industry and so forth, we need a change in the political system so that it's actually there is a green political platform which is actually supported by the electorate and is understood by the electorate and that will drive the way in which uh, politicians think and act the transition to a, a green economy what does that mean a lot of the thinking around the green new deal addresses those issues so thinking's been done on that the transparency of the corporate and the media and how it gets its funding, very important in terms of how politics is influenced. Strategy for oil transition, probably the single biggest thing that really needs to be addressed. If we turn off the taps of producing oil, the political consequences for the Middle East, Russia, China, North America, South America are just uh, massive. And there is no evidence that I see that the real strategy is for that. And the other thing is a vision for a sustainable future. So the three challenges for me are, you know, reform the global economic model, design and understand what we mean by green growth and a just society, and manage that process of transition and the geopolitical changes that's going to be associated with um, switching off the taps to the oil industry. My aspirations for COP26, I guess I would like an acknowledgement that the current global model needs to change. I would like to see evidence of a strategy for transition from an oil dependent global economy. And most of all, I would like to see a vision for what a sustainable global civilization actually looks like. And what does that mean? And how do we actually have something positive to encourage people to make the changes that are required. So I think that is me. Thank you very much, Richard. Uh, lots to think about, I think, in there. Um, Peter Hetherington is up next. So Peter is past chair of the Town and Country Planning Association, but perhaps better known uh, for being a former regional affairs editor of The Guardian. So over to you, Peter. 
Um, thanks very much, Fiona. Um, I've just been um, on a walk for about 90 minutes around um, the Tyne Valley. I live in the valley floor and I kind of walk a mile out of the valley and I kind of cross um, cultivated pasture, some nice woodland, um, rough land, uh, sheep, cattle, um, just about everything. So within about, I guess, a radius of five miles, um, land and its multiplicity of uses um, is there in, in microcosm. And it, it's got me thinking of this for quite some time. And, and, and it really came to prominence at the back end of last year. Um, because we know life is the ultimate self-sustaining source and land gives it that self-sustainability and everything like that. But the multiplicity of uses I find um, kind of important because we don't have any coordinated strategy in England particularly to address land use. On the back end of last year, 300 scientists from the UN's Food and Agriculture Organization um, came together to remind us that the worsening state of soils is, quote, at least as important as the climate crisis and destruction of the natural world above ground. Uh, few things matter more, they said, to humans than soil. And that is um, absolutely true. And to some extent, that's the basis of, um, of my new book, looking at land, its renewal, its importance to the country, um, its use, abuse, ownership, potential, all that stuff. Because I do know there's a kind of general acceptance that our rights over land, if you like, transcend narrow ownership, that they constitute a kind of social relationship, and that the distinction between public and private has become rather blurred over recent years, particularly with creation of uh, national parks. Um, now, I know that unlike parks in the USA, they're not publicly owned, but we all have that kind of ownership with them and from them to areas of special scientific interest. I never ask myself, well, actually, I do quite a bit. Who owns this land? I do feel I can roam anywhere. So that's one kind of starting point. And I guess our citizenship gives us all at least an interest and a collective stake um, in land. But the main point, or one of the main points of my book, is that we do lack a coordinated strategy. On the one hand, um, the emerging environmental land management scheme of DEFRA um, tells us that if we plant X number of hedgerows, it's the equivalent of Y taking Y number of cars or Z number of cars off the road, uh, which is fine until you look at the Department for Transport's um, land hungry and carbon heavy road building program on my last estimate about 27 billion pounds. And if you look at the comments from Barbara Young, the former chief exec of the Environment Agency in I think Fiona, the last, yeah, the, the, it was a special report she did earlier this year anyway. I mean, she had talked about the kind of dysfunction in Whitehall too, and the fact that um, MHCLG as was, um, is kind of disconnected from the whole debate, that it simply isn't plugged in to any coherence, if there is any. So I'm very much with um, Lord Deben, John Gummer, chair of the CCC, and before that, a Conservative Environment Secretary, that we do need to address land in the round to the extent he says we need a fully functioning department for land. I perhaps wouldn't go as far as that, but I do think in Whitehall, we have to have some coherence about land use in this country because we don't have anyway. Scotland is getting there with its Scottish Land Commission. I know it's some way off full-scale land reform, but frankly, the fact that Scotland does aspire to have um, a million acres of land under community ownership in the next four or five years, and at present they're approaching 600,000 acres, is quite good. And when they're talking about um, acquiring land for affordable housing in rural areas particularly, not simply using planning legislation that currently exists, but perhaps using um, the likely potential of the 
third iteration of Scottish land reform to address community housing um, is kind of quite exciting. You know, acquiring land at existing use value, trying to negotiate with owners um, if they agree, if they don't slap a CPO on for a small parcel of land. That is an active debate in Scotland. And I find it particularly fascinating at the present time that while there is this incredible dysfunction in Whitehall, absolutely no coherent strategy at all. And Fiona will know as well, when it comes to planning, total deregulation, um, you know, an abomination of the 47 Town and Country Planning Act, but the ethos of that act still exists in Scotland and in Wales. And when we talk about land, agriculture, use, abuse, potential challenges, all that stuff, we are talking now about distinctly different policies in the three nations of Britain. I haven't talked about Northern Ireland, but let's say we have a share in one of the four nations of the islands of Britain. So I find that whole approach kind of interesting. But broadly, I think we've got to accept that, you know, unless we reform land use and have that policy coherence, we don't stand a chance of getting towards uh, cutting emissions to reach net zero by whatever year it is that, you know, um, it's only five months ago that the Committee for Climate Change warned that Britain is even now lagging behind its key goal of 70% cuts to greenhouse gas emissions by 2035. So I find, you know, ministers really much, uh, they're kind of talking the talk when it comes to action and putting that reality or the, the, the rhetoric into reality, I really do find them sadly wanting at the present time. So England lacks that kind of bold reformist measures that are needed to um, transform um, land use. And what I find fascinating, um, and I'm honestly not looking at the past through soil spattered spectacles, but when you actually look at the, the vision and the action of turning rhetoric into reality, um, particularly during the last half of the previous century, then governments did act quite forcefully. I mean, amazingly, um, the most ambitious tranche of land reform ever conceived in the British Isles was the 1919 Land Settlement Scotland Act which created from nothing 6,000 crops or small holdings in record time. Just amazing, partly through compulsory purchase. And then right through that period of the 30s, the creation of the Land Settlement Association, 2,000 small holdings around the country, quite remarkable. And the, the emergence of county council farms kind of started at a slow pace early in the um, 20th century, really ramped up uh, through the 20s and 30s, to the extent that before the First World War, perhaps half a million acres of land, farmland, good land in, the, in, in England and a bit in Wales, owned by county councils. Now they're flogged off quite a bit, but still that's around 200,000 acres, which I regard as, 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 as quite remarkable. Anyway, um, could I just mention this as well, that it's really important that when we look at the reforms taking place currently, the environmental land management scheme being put forward by DEFRA um, to actually try and um, negotiate some logic around what is a fairly complex system. Um, because the more I dig into DEFRA's approach, the more I become kind of alarmed that um, we're now at a stage of phasing, tapering down agricultural support to the extent that by 2027, 28, it'll be eliminated, by which time um, elms will kick in. Uh, that's fine. And I'm honestly not feeling sorry for farmers or trying to put a gloss on how um, the CAP subsidy regime subsidized those who had too much land anyway at the expense of those perhaps who didn't too little. But the fact is, we are approaching the most profound changes in land use in England, particularly since the 1947 Agriculture Act, without any public discourse or any debate whatsoever, which I find quite alarming. And the way things are going, we're going to find that in five or six years' time, um, 
sheep will have left much of our uplands. Many farmers, perhaps a third of the farming workforce, will have left the land and taken a good golden goodbye from DEFRA. And, you know, unless we're very careful, communities are going to lose what control over land they have. And having talked to a really good guy in his late eighties now, a guy called John Dunning, who was and still is a small farmer. He's got less than a thousand acres in Cumbria, but he's the guy behind TB services. We needn't go into TB services in too much detail, but he's a classic land champion, a very informed guy, um, knows what he's talking about, sat on lots of um, national and international farming bodies. And his great fear is that unless we're careful, communities will lose that essential control they have, partly through tenant farming. The farms will disappear. The big boys will move in. They will smell money from carbon trading. Um, what he says, green gold, but he talks about green prairie, green prairies kind of emerging on the uplands. And um, if we're not very careful, those big boys will have acquired an awful lot of land, uh, will be exploiting the arms regime and the likely um, carbon payments from it, and carbon trading will be taking place apace because it is the new game in town, not a game, the new reality um, of the hills. And you know, if the government uh, is having great trouble pricing nature to compensate farmers for, let's say, encouraging biodiversity and encouraging nature, the big boys in the city certainly aren't. Um, and um, I, I, I do feel that um, unless we're careful, we need to really um, um, be aware of those dangers because communities at present have little control over land use, but that control they do have could, could disappear. And I am bang with Rebecca on this one, that, that, that the more communities are involved, and we find this with wind turbines and lots of other things, the more they can be brought on sign on site, and they do get that wider agenda of carbon neutrality, of actually keeping carbon in the ground, of living more green lifestyles, and trying to actually address the carbon challenge at a local level. And the way things are kind of shaping up, I think we're going to lose that momentum. So, I mean, basically to sum up, I think we need to try and ramp up um, um, this debate taking place below the political radar screen at the present time. Most people are unaware of it, but unless we're careful in a few years time, the uplands of Britain and perhaps many of the uplands too will have changed beyond recognition if we're not careful. There is one, one bright spot in all this, and it simply is this, that um, uh, I have been amazed over the past year, research and land use and um, various other things connected with land, about the ability of local communities to begin local food growing projects, to get local food networks underway. At present, it's largely a kind of middle class phenomenon, but the sum of the parts of those local networks and local food producers do add up to something quite significant, from regenerative to nature-friendly farming, to the Land Workers Alliance, to lots of other organisations. There's a real momentum building up there. So that would be great to see taken off in a rather more substantial scale. So that leads me to think that the glass sometimes can be half full as well as half empty. Thank okay. you, Peter. Thank you very much. Uh, and finally, I must introduce Stevie Desai. Um, Stevie is a lecturer um, sorry, in sociology and a science and technology studies research fellow in the Institute for the Study of the Human at the University of Sheffield. Sorry for stumbling over that. Over to you, Stevie. Oh, you're on mute. Sorry, so I'm going to briefly share a slide, which kind of forms the background, the background to this talk. And this is not a beautiful slide. This is what most people think of when I talk about the research that I do. We talk about responsible stagnation and they see stagnation as this sort of strange dead pond. Now, I'm a science and technology studies scholar, really. And so the book that I'm talking about today, which is called Responsibility Beyond Growth, I am a representative of a collaboration between the 10 scholars, really, on that book. 
Um, we wrote it all together, not as a traditional edited volume. And it's a collaboration between the science and technology people, political scientists and economists. And what we were interested in, because a lot of us came from the world of innovation, was rather looking at this idea of the innovation matrix that was sort of going around at the time uh, when we first started this, which was back in 2016. And so there was this idea of using the innovation system to produce smart growth, sustainable growth, blah, blah growth. Um, and of course, you know, you know, nobody wants the irresponsible side of the matrix. We don't want to do irresponsibly stagnant. We don't want to turn into that green dead pond. But we also, we don't want to innovate irresponsibly. We don't want to just move fast and burn things, for example. We want to think about what we're doing. We want to be careful about it. We want to involve the public. We want a social mandate. We want to solve the grand challenges, et cetera. And that was responsible innovation. So the genesis of this was simply being at a conference where these things happen at the conference dinner. And I was having a conversation with somebody who'd come to a panel I was in earlier. And we were both responsible stagnation. What's that? What's in that fourth quadrant? So we started the fourth quadrant research network. So we are here. And this is basically where we do our work. And what we have thought of, I'll stop sharing, of as responsible stagnation, um, after quite a lot of hemming and lying and a lot of seminars in which we threw ideas around and learned from the economists about how the innovation really works about um, what climate change policy really has as its economic basis, and they learned from us about things, we came up with this very loose definition. And our definition is, what we're looking for is a particular configuration of change where ethics matters as a driving force of innovation, where we're advocating restraint and living gently in terms of the way that we're innovating, and we're including ideas that also include the scope and the pace of change and its effects on particular populations. So what do I actually mean by that? Um, kind of picking up on what Rebecca said, you know, I agree, we really do need a new social contract between the people and the state. I don't have a lot of faith that we're going to get it because one of the real problems that we identified is the way counters of national health are pegged to GDP. That's been problematized a lot, but as we started looking about, you know, what would be policy objectives? What could we actually ask for in terms of policy? Well, all policies pegged to percentage of GDP. So this one figure is so completely embedded in the entire system. And it's a fallacy, sustainable growth. It is impossible to keep growing and growing and growing. And the problem with GDP as a measure of growth, as a measure of economic health, and worse, as a measure of social health and social prosperity, is that it does not include the value of the non-renewable resources which you have consumed to produce that growth. It does not include the value of the labor, of the, the great amount of innovation that actually goes on that doesn't actually produce a monetary value. So, you know, as an example, so if I buy three pounds worth of ingredients and I put in seven pounds of, of labor to make some lasagna, I've only contributed three pounds to GDP. But you know, if I sell that lasagna to Fiona for 10 pounds, now suddenly I've contributed 10 pounds. So, so yay, that's better. But if you really want to look at it from the responsible stagnation perspective, what we would say is if I give a hundred pounds to a charity to feed the homeless, and now they buy from Fiona say 10 lasagnas at 10 pounds. They have added that 100 pounds to GDP, that's great, but they've only fed 10 people. Now, if we get an army of volunteers and we buy three pounds worth of ingredients then we can feed 33 people, it looks like we've actually not added the same 100 pounds, but in fact, we've added 23 people to prosperity and we've really added 330 pounds to GDP if you include the labor as adding something of value. So we need to, I feel, in order to enact any kind of useful policies, any, you know, to make COP26 any more useful than all the COPs that have come before, and for it not to be, you know, in the various words of Greta Sunder, yet another blah, blah, blah. Um, we need to actually look at the kind of indicators that we're using in order to measure the progress that we're making. 
And so that for us is the primary one. Um, putting prices on you know, carbon markets, putting prices on ecosystem services, which is effectively nature's ability to renew itself. This is not the way to go. To marketize and monetize absolutely every single thing as a way of trying to understand um, is not going to get us where we need to go. So I'm going to end with just one other thought, which is the capacity to externalize the costs of not only the innovation and the, um, the growth that we have, but our inability to actually see what the hidden cost of growth might be. So I'll leave you with the thought of Bitcoin, which may look really, really interesting, but the energy costs of Bitcoin for the server farms that are required and continually required to grow, to run an innovation like that are astronomical and basically make hash of any other goal that we might have. And I'll leave it at that. Thank you ever so much. And thank you to everybody. I know um, we have run slightly over, but I think um, everyone was giving such interesting contributions um, that hopefully the audience won't mind. And we have had some questions in, so I will try and gallop through some of those. And I must ask our panelists if they could give us punchy, pithy responses would be <laughs> much appreciated just so we could get through some and then still hopefully wrap up on time because I appreciate people are very busy. Um, so a question for you, Rebecca, first, if that's okay. Um, you mentioned the Climate Assembly UK and making democracy work better for people. What specific lessons should COP26 take from the Climate Assembly? Well, there is an incredible experiment happening right now, which is a global citizens assembly on climate change. And um, it's, it's, it's literally an attempt to join up a citizens conversation around the world. So I really encourage people to have a look at that. Um, I think that the, the lesson for COP26, I would say it would be for each country to not assume what mandate it has from its people, but to actually ask. And, um, you know, there is this, we, we, we know that concern for climate, concern about climate is absolutely sky high around the world across all demographics, but we don't really have the intelligence about how particular climate policies will or won't be successful and particularly how that transition is managed. So I think, um, you know, Peter's example of, um, what of, 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 of rural areas and what, you know, net zero land use, how net zero land use will change how the land looks and how rural communities work. And, you know, as someone living in Cumbria with farmers in the family, this is very live for me. Um, you know, are we actually having that conversation with them? Are we actually talking to them about how best to support, you know, support them in um, more sustainable land use practices? So that's just one example. But it's basically saying, you know, reach out and, and talk. That sounds like hopelessly basic and idealistic, but that is what it comes down to. Thank you very much. Um, and Richard, questions for you. And I think drawing on, uh, they were actually asked before Stevie spoke, but I think they very much relate to Stevie's point and, and the phrase responsible stagnation, which I think is fantastic. Um, but people have, uh, a couple of questions have asked around the definition of growth. And I know you mentioned green growth and a just society. And so people are, I think, saying, should it just be about a just society, regardless of whether or not there's any growth? Um, and so what do we do about that sort of obsession with growth? Should we not be looking at uh, being more agnostic about growth? Yeah, I mean, that, this is key to the whole thing, isn't it, really? What sort of society do we want? How do we measure it? Who sets the measures? Who benefits from those measures? Um, I think let's broadly call them vested interests. Those people who actually currently benefit from the, the current economic model. Um, GDP as a measure suits their objectives, it relates to their objectives. And if they can sell that as a good thing, then that actually support, supports that. So um, as Stevie said, you know, the flaws in using GDP as a measure, yeah, immense. Does it tell us anything about a quality of life? Does it tell, tell us anything about the equality or distribution of income? I mean, if uh, Jeff Bezos and a couple of his mates went to Fiji, GDP of Fiji would probably go up, but 
probably nobody would necessarily benefit. They might, they might do. Um, so yeah, the, the, the idea of how you actually have a no growth economy and is such a thing possible? Uh, yeah, I could envisage that would, would be possible where people have fulfilling lives. Um, but it, it's, a matter, it's a question of what measures do we, we want to use? And I think if we can change those measures, that would be a good step. The really big challenge is uh, less related perhaps to directly to COP and discussions about it, but uh, we work closely with the Department for Leveling Up. And so, of course, lots of discussions people might have seen about what leveling up will mean. And of course, some metrics it being discussed at the Conservative Party conference people might have seen fringe events and things and ministers talking about job creation productivity and of course other people saying leveling up has to be about so much more than that we've got to think about education we've got to think about uh, health inequalities you so we've got to move away from that fixation uh, I think if but I know that's much easier said than done Stevie I don't know if you wanted to come back on any of any of those points really I do I'd love to jump in uh, because <laughs> agnostic is the perfect word that growth agnostic is exactly the term that we use in the book um, we need to be innovating, we need to be doing things for different reasons, not because we're going to contribute to GDP, definitely. Can I um, just make one, one quick point? Yeah. Um, um, Rebecca talked about communities, and I did a bit as well. Um, less than an hour from my front door, there's a place called Langham Moor in uh, Dumfrieshire, just over the border. Well, last year, a local community trust raised almost four million pounds to buy 5,200 acres of land from Buclue Estates, who were the biggest landowner in Scotland. They aim to develop a nature reserve, promote tourism, create new woodlands, restore peatland, and place nature's recovery at the heart of their initiative. Now, that has several consequences, not least it is the foundational economy writ large, because I don't know how you value this in economic or GDP terms, but, you know, in, in purely um, community sustainability terms, um, it's immense the potential for something like this. Um, could never happen in England at the present time because part of the dosh to raise the money came from um, um, the Scottish Land Fund and other sources. But it just shows you what local ambition can achieve uh, allied to local democracy. Um, uh, only wish in the uplands of the North Pennines and Lakeland and elsewhere in the Yorkshire Dales uh, there could be similar initiatives, but we can only hope, I guess. Thank you. Sorry, that was more of a statement than a question, but there you go. That's okay. It was a contribution, which is... Contribution. Okay. Um, Rebecca, I think... Um, I was going to say a quick question for you, not, potentially not. Uh, but um, somebody has asked, how do we encourage, you, encourage policymakers to think and act more globally rather than locally? Were you on mute? Sorry. Sorry, uh, that isn't a quick question, is it? No, um, it the, I think it, um, uh, it, it's really important for, for countries to, for, for, for national leaders to make the case about how their country com co uh, contributes to the global picture. So one of the most problematic climate tropes that you hear in the UK is, ah, oh, but what about China? <laughs> and that is absolute whataboutery. And in fact, it, climate is, um, is it, climate diplomacy is not a zero sum game. It's actually the opposite, where the um, you know the individual efforts add up to more than the sum of their parts. You know, to put it crudely, um, if the UK is shown to be doing credible, ambitious stuff, that makes China China more likely to, not less. And I don't think there's nearly enough sort of grown up debate about that. And you know. The, um, a, a, a lot of feeling instead that we shouldn't be, you know, it goes back to this idea that it's burden sharing. I don't think it's burden sharing at all to, <coughs> excuse me, not burden sharing at all to, um, you know, transition your economy in the way that we absolutely need to do to face the future. Yeah, thank you. I'm conscious we've got four minutes left, so I will put this final question to each of you if that's okay. Um, and somebody has said, which countries or so perhaps if you could pick your top one, uh, should we look to for inspiration um, about how they are addressing climate change and approaching COP? 
Um, so perhaps if I go to you in the order in which you spoke, if that's okay. So I'm sorry, Rebecca, coming to you first. Um, okay, Scandinavia for um, for <laughs> for home energy, definitely. Uh, Costa Rica for uh, what they just won the Earthshot Prize for. Um, uh, probably China for uh, transitioning an economy over 20 years faster than anyone's seen and there's lessons there. Um, you know, if you could patch together a perfect strategy made from lots of bits that lots of countries have done, that would be amazing. UK on offshore wind. Um, you know, there's there's plenty of inspiration there, definitely. Um, but I, I, I think, I mean, we have to face it. No one country yet has a Paris compatible climate strategy. Thank you very much. Richard, who should we be looking to for inspiration? I really don't know the answer to this question, but I, I would say that I know a little bit about China. And in spite of all the problems that China actually cause and the massive amount of change that they need to make, the things that they are doing over in China and the rate at which they're adopting new technologies is amazing. Um, and I would also hope for inspiration from what Joe Biden is going to do, because I think if he leaves a legacy where the environment is seen as a political ground for politics to compete on in the same way that the NHS is in the UK, that would be an amazing step forward. Thank you. Peter, is there somebody we should look to for inspiration in relation to land? I'm afraid I'd, I'd, I'd go local again. I'd look to Scotland, I'd look to the island of Egg, community owned, I'd look to the North Harris Estate, 68,000 acres, I'd look to Langham Moor. Also, uh, crucially, I'd look to a very young Scottish land reform minister. I plugged into a, um, a webinar a couple of weeks ago. Um, Mary McCallan, uh, only 28 years old, really plugged into the whole case. The fact that Scotland has a land commission means it's, you know, a land can never ever escape from being towards the top of the agenda is fairly important. And actually on the global front as well, or, or, or the national front, somebody just put a message on the screen there that, that really it's fine having these community enterprises as far as they go, but governments do have a role, surely. Of course they do. Um, Scotland recently slapped business rates on sporting estates. If the Westminster government could look at capital gains and um, inheritance tax, um, removing the benefits from um, landowners and the incentives to actually buy land, that would have a transformative effect on land ownership and use abuse um, in, uh, in the UK generally and remove um, um, I think a certain sense of uh, entitlement from certain people that perhaps what they decided was good for their land was good from, for everybody else. I do think it's time for um, small steps which could have fairly significant results. Thank you, Peter. And Stevie, who can, who can inspire us in relation to responsible stagnation? I'll, I'll give you three very quick answers. So half of our network is from the global south. And so we look quite a lot at, at ideas like Buen Vivir, which uh, is a Spanish idea of you know, what is the good life, um, different ways of innovation, um, what they call Jugad innovation, restrained resource, um, constrained resource innovation, sorry. So different ways of doing things. Um, in terms of more Western industrial economy, I think Finland is an interesting example. Um, it's a high innovation economy that really values education. It is relatively highly taxed, but the indicators that they use to monitor health of both the environment and of the population are much more suited for purpose. Uh, they do tend to have you know, very good protection of the environment, and they do tend to have a very good social well-being, very good lifestyle. And the other one is New Zealand with a COVID response. I think makes a really, really interesting example to look and see how economically they have and are continuing to cope with that and what kind of indicators they're using to get themselves back on track. Thank you very much. Really interesting. And thank you all of you, actually. Those are really good things, I think, to help us think about and places to look at for those interested in finding out some more and thinking about what we might need to change. Uh, I am conscious it's now one minute past five, so apologies, um, but thank you to uh, all of our speakers. Thank you to Rebecca, Richard, Peter and Stevie. I hope 
people have enjoyed it and so thank you to our audience for joining and for your questions. I must reiterate the 50% off discount code, which is CLIMATE50, um, and uh, means you can buy all of our the books written by our panel members. Um, and also, as I think has been mentioned in the chat, please do consider joining the next Bristol University Press webinar, which will be on the future of universities. So thank you, everybody. Thank you to our panel members. Uh, and I hope everybody has a lovely evening. Thank you.